Bring your Bibles up to the sixth chapter. Boy, we're making progress here. Chapter six of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the sixth chapter. Looking at verses 1 through 4 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4, second part of a message that we began last week entitled Raising Children to Do Right. Let's pray. Father, we open the word now together to, to hear from you. There is much, our Father, in this passage that we need to hear and we need to take to heart. And so may your spirit apply these truths to us where they are needful in each and every one of our lives. We ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Beloved, about 38 years ago, almost 38 years ago now, my wife and I had the privilege of bringing home from the hospital a, a beautiful, bouncing baby girl. And we were young, to be sure. And we brought uh, this package home from the hospital, and we were living in Ohio at the time, far from our families. And I can distinctly remember when we got home this feeling that kind of came over me, like, now what? I turned her every which way but loose, upside down, and I was looking for the directions that are supposed to be written on the box, and there weren't any. There weren't any. And so... We made our entrance into parenting and sort of learning as you go uh, the process. God was very, very gracious to us along the way, and, and uh, our oldest daughter is an absolute delight to our hearts uh, these many years later. And, you know, I think that, that reality that children don't come with instructions, there is no instruction manual included when you come home, there's nothing on the packaging. You, you get there and you, and you recognize the reality that now you have been entrusted with another life and, and you're, you're aware of how um, poor a job you've done with your own life <laughs> much of the time. And now you've got someone else's life that's been entrusted to you. And so there's a weightiness to that. There's a, there's a soberness that comes to, to being a parent and particularly, I think, as you start as a young parent. And I suspect that's why parenting classes and and seminars are such a perennial favorite among evangelicals. You can uh, fill, we could fill this room if we were to bring in the right speaker and advertise it as a parenting seminar. We'd have no trouble uh, packing out this room uh, because I think people recognize that they have a lot of needs in this area. And I think that's further aggravated in our day and age because of the, of the breakdown within the families and, and what in eras gone by would be the intergenerational sharing of wisdom has in large degree broken down for us as a society and we live with fractured families and, and not uh, the, the nuclear family that the Bible uh, certainly intends and contemplates and the intergenerational ministry that can and should exist with grandparents and parents and children and so forth. And so there's just a sense, I think, that people have that, wow, there's a lot I don't know. And and i got to know these things because i got a tremendous responsibility before me. And so here in this section of Ephesians, there's really only a few verses here that Paul devotes to the topic of, of parenting and children, but they're powerful verses. There's a lot of information here directly and certainly by implication that is worthy of our study and our thoughtful uh, investigation and prayer. And and so I want to say that that this is important stuff. And it's clearly important for young moms and young dads, but it's not just important for young moms and young dads. It's, It's important for all generations. And the reason that's true is because generationally, we are inextricably connected to one another. We are, many if not most of us, uh, simultaneously parents and children and perhaps even grandparents, and so we are in a number of these kinds of relationships, and, and this passage talks about all of that. 
So this is important stuff. As I say, we're returning to this now for the second time, entitled Raising Children to Do Right. And our structure here is a threefold approach. Paul giving us a threefold approach to raising children to do right in a world that does wrong. The threefold approach to raising children to do right in a world that does wrong. Now, last week, we, able, we were able to look at the first uh, part of that in verses 1 and 2, and it was simply this. It was to help them, that is the children, help them to recognize their obligation. We are to raise our children to do right by, first off, helping them to recognize their obligation, verses 1 and 2. Children, Paul says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise. We noted last time that that in looking at this passage, that the, the children that Paul is addressing here are children that are young enough to still be within the home, uh, for that was the context of the gathering of the church. And furthermore, over in verse 4, where uh, Paul talking to fathers here about bringing them up in the, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, so that it is children in the home, but it is simultaneously, it is children in the home who are old enough to hear the words from the apostle and to, and to heed them. That is to, 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 to sit down and, and to listen and say, this is the word of God, am I going to obey it? Am I going to obey it? And so he gives this direct command not to the parents but to the children, and that gives us a little bit of insight, I think, into the who, uh, who these children are. And, of course, by application, if your children are too young in that role, then it falls to you as, as parents to, to uh, insist that they learn to obey and, um, and help them, uh, put them in the right place to, to finally hear and heed Paul's words. And why? Why are, must they obey or literally do what they're told? The answer is simple here, verse 1, for it's the right thing to do. For it's right. Paul doesn't go into a long discussion about it at all. He just simply says, he declares, this is right. Dekaios, this is righteous. This is the right thing to do. In other words, this expresses the heart and mind of God. It, it, is, it is woven into the Mosaic Covenant. You read carefully your Old Testament, certainly the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books there are the Old Testament, and you will see repeatedly the, 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 the heart of God expressed in that with regard to children, you need to obey your parents. So if you're sitting here this morning, you are old enough to hear me, old enough to process what I'm saying to you, uh, you are old enough to, to, to make a decision here, am I going to obey or am I not? I'm just going to say it to you. You are living in your parents' house what God wants from you is to do what you're told. It's as simple as that. Do what you are told. Paul speaks in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20, a parallel kind of passage addressing the same topic. And he says, There, children, obey your parents in everything. Why? For it pleases the Lord. So here he says, for it is right. There he says, for it pleases the Lord. What pleases the, roar, the Lord? That which is right. What is right? That which pleases the Lord. It's simple as that. Now, beyond that, as I say, the, the rightness of all of this is, is clear in the Ten Commandments themselves. And that's what Paul does here in verse 2, is he quotes the Fifth Commandment. He brings forward the Fifth Commandment in, in support of this statement. And we know that the Ten Commandments are the, are the entrance into the Mosaic Covenant. It's the, it's the foyer that, that takes one into the Mosaic Covenant. And there in the, fifth co in the Fifth Commandment, honor your father and your mother, verse 3, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So Paul demands here of the children obedience and then honor. Obedience and honor. And we noted last time that they're not identical. There's tremendous overlap. They're not identical. In other words, in the home, if you are in the home, then you honor by obeying. You honor by obeying. If you are outside of the home, in other words, when a, when a man right, leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two become one flesh, right? 
then at that point he has left that relationship with regard to the need to obey, but the, but the need to honor, the requirement to honor, the obligation to honor remains. And so for all of us, we are to honor our mother and father. We are to honor our parents. And we spent a lot of time last week looking at some, some suggestions, some possible ways to, to, to go about honoring your parents. And we also looked at how as parents to to make it easier for your children to do that. In other words, to be honorable as parents. So, Paul noticed, or I want you to notice here that, that uh, Paul inserts a, a parenthetical here in verse 2 where he says, this is the first commandment with a promise. In other words, he notes that here in the fifth commandment, there is a, there is a promise associated with it. And what is that promise? It's a, it's a promise of a long and a prosperous life for those who obey. The fifth commandment contains a promise for a long and prosperous life for those who obey. And that takes me to what I want to call here the, the, the second aspect of this threefold approach to teaching your children to do right, and that is to encourage them to see the connection. Okay? Encourage them to see the connection. So help them to recognize the obligation, and then secondly, encourage them to see the connection. Verse 3, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Honor your father and your mother so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Incorporated here by God through Moses in the fifth commandment is this original commandment to the nation of Israel that has a promise attached. And the promise is simply this. When you honor your parents, you as children will enjoy the benefits of the Mosaic Covenant. They will come to you. And what are those? It is a long and prosperous life in the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16, there in Deuteronomy, right, we have the second giving of the law. We find the Ten Commandments again given to the nation 40 years after the Exodus when that first disobedient and rebellious generation had died out. It is, it is given again, the second giving of the law to the people standing on the edge of the promised land. You are entering into the land and here are the terms of the covenant as you go in. And so Moses says there, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God gives you. The promise still attached. Okay? Honor your mother and your father and you will live a long and prosperous life in this promised land. And we can summarize this principle uh, rather simply as this, obedience brings blessing, disobedience brings cursing. Obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings cursing. And it is that reality of the terms of the Mosaic Covenant that, that really lie underneath the entire book of Proverbs. Now we spent months here and just recently ended on Sunday mornings going through the book of Proverbs, and I, and, I, and I made that point, I stressed that point over and over and over again, that this is the understanding that lies under this book. Obedience brings blessing, disobedience brings cursing. All right? But we're not under the Mosaic Covenant. You might say, well, but, but David, that, you know, that's the promise to Israel. We're not Israel. And, and I would say, yes, you're absolutely right. We are not Israel. And we are not under the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. So why does Paul include this promise in a letter written to Gentile believers? Why didn't he just stop at verse 2, honor your father and your mother? Why does he continue on to, to include in, in the the promise side of it, and include the parenthetical to point it out to us. He's making, he's getting after something here. Now, some commentators, they're, they're sort of twisted in knots with this by, by their presupposition, and, and so they come away saying, well, well, what Paul really means here in verse 3 is, is that if you honor your father and mother, then you will, you will 
have eternal life. And then and they, and they spiritualize this, this promise that it may be well with you and you will live long on the earth into a, into a kind of a promise of, of eternal life. In other words, that if you, if you honor your father and mother, which is the expression of the mind of God, that's what a Christian should do. You walk in the spirit in these things, right? Chapter 5, verse 18. That it, then you are possessors of eternal life and you will, you will enjoy that eternal life. And that's how they try to get at the answer. The problem is they have to turn themselves on their heads in order to be able to do it. Because listen, if Paul had wanted to tie the fifth commandment here into uh, the, the promise of eternal life, then he would have used the words eternal life. But he doesn't. In fact, very, you know, he's very specific here that you will live long. He doesn't say eternal life. And there's a, there is a Greek expression for eternal life that is used throughout the New Testament. But he doesn't use it here. He says, you will live long. And notice, he says, you will live long, not in heaven, but you will live long on the earth. On the earth. So Paul is not embarrassed by, he's not pulling back from the, the, the statement of the original fifth commandment. So why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And I think the answer for, for why he's doing this is he's reminding the, the believers here, reminding the, the children and the church at large of the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God that has been baked into the creation. And the wisdom of God baked into the creation is simply this, obedience and material blessings go together. They go together. Now, some have taken that and run with it and created a, a perversion called the prosperity gospel. But, but, but the fact that that is a perversion and, and doesn't mean that we have to pull away from the reality of that God has created his, his world to operate in a certain way and then there are certain laws associated with it. And obedience and blessing are tied together. Now, they do not perfectly correlate. And the fact that they don't perfectly correlate is, is really the subject of the book of Ecclesiastes. That's why we have the book of Ecclesiastes, is the fact that when you live life, you recognize that, well, if obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings cursing, how come it's not a one-for-one? One? How come they're not perfectly correlated? Well, read the book of Ecclesiastes. But the reality remains... The reality remains that the path of obedience is the path of blessing. And it is the path of blessing in this life. In this life. And so as parents, we need to encourage those under our care to understand this reality. That there is a correlation between blessings and obedience. Now how do you go about doing that? You've got children in the home. How do you go about helping them to understand the, the, the correlation here. A couple of suggestions for you. One is to read the Old Testament together with them. And as you read the Old Testament together with them, point out the connection along the way between obedience and the way of blessing. Because it's very, very clear. Over and over and over again, you will see, I mean, think about the kings of Israel and so forth. The blessing comes through obedience. It has always come that way for the people of God. And it is disobedience. It is rebellion that brings about the curse of God, the disfavor of God. So read the Old Testament to your children. And don't just read it to them, but, but interact with them along the way. A second suggestion on, on how to go about doing this is to graciously and humbly make observation from the events of life, the connection between obedience and blessing and disobedience and cursing. Make that observation from your own life. As, you, as you're raising your children, talk about your own life and, and talk about the times when, when, you were, when you did not obey God and the results that came to you. Talk about their life and how when they 
fight against the Lord, it brings really negative consequences and, and help them to see that the path of obedience is, is the path of blessing. Look at others and make observation of their lives too. Again, graciously and humbly, not from a point of, of like, you know, you've got it all figured out and look at these other, you know, poor slobs, but, but point out the reality that all around you, your own life, their life, life at large, there's a correlation here, a very strong correlation. And we need to, to help our children to see that. Proverbs 13, 15, it says, Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. The way of the treacherous is hard. Speak to your children about how when you have fallen into the path of the treasures, your life has been hard. You know, life has been hard. And that leads us now to the third aspect. The third aspect of our approach in, in teaching children to do right in a world that does wrong. Verse 4, show them the gospel by your example. Show them the gospel by your example. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, we might expect Paul to, he's, he started out here addressing children. We might expect him to, to continue here in verse 4 to, to address the children and tell the children here, listen, do not you know, provoke your father to anger, or do not, you know, do not provoke your mother and your father to anger, right? He's talked about the need to honor them and so forth, so it would, it would seem logical for him to continue that, uh, addressing the children directly and say, don't provoke your parents, but instead, Paul turns it on its head now, right? And, and he turns from children to fathers, specifically here. Right? He's, he's talked about parents, verse 1. He's talked about, about father and mother, verse 2. But here, verse 4, he's, he, he narrows in, he, he focuses like a laser in on the father himself. And he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Why does he do that? Why does he narrow it to fathers? Some think it's just stylistic, and what he really means is fathers and mothers, but I don't think so. Um, there's application to mothers here, to be sure. Okay, ladies, so, you know, you can't just, like, check out the rest of the sermon. Okay? There's application here for sure, but, but fathers, I think he's zeroing in on us. I think we are in the crosshairs here. Why? Well, for these reasons. Because fathers bear the primary responsibility for the spiritual health of their homes. That's why. It's the nature of what it means to be a man. And we, when we talked about the responsibilities of husbands, we made that point over and over again. Listen, fathers, the spiritual health of your home is your responsibility. It is your responsibility. Beyond that, I think there's a secondary reason here. And I think that's because fathers are really good at provoking their children. I think fathers do a really good job at provoking their children. In fact, it's, I think, not without meaning to recognize that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, when talking about the qualifications of elders, that Paul specifically says they must keep their children under control with all dignity. He doesn't just say you need to keep your kids under control. But he talks about how, fathers, you need to keep your children under control. You need to do it in a manner with dignity. With dignity. So Paul here, I believe, is specifically commanding fathers to demonstrate the gospel to their children in two ways. First, by avoiding ungodly behaviors. And secondly, by engaging in the shepherding of the heart of your children. By by avoiding engaging in ungodly behaviors, and secondly, by engaging in the shepherding of the heart of your children. So, first, uh, the avoiding of the ungodly behaviors. The first part of verse 4. Do not provoke. Fathers, do not provoke. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Again, that, that 
teaching there in, to the church at Colossae of, of similar terms. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Do not exasperate them so they will not lose heart. So, dad, dads, how do we exasperate our children? What are some of the ways that we provoke our children, men? Let me suggest them to you. And again, um, this doesn't mean that moms are off the hook here, okay? Moms can engage in the same kinds of things. But as I said, I believe he's speaking to fathers here because of the primary responsibility for his home and the spiritual temperature of his home. So here they are. They offer you a few. Fathers provoke their children to anger or exasperate them when they operate by a double standard with regard to sin, when they operate by a double standard. In other words, that the way that the, the standard for what's sin and what's the appropriate consequences of sin for the children is different than it is for dad. The whole do as I say, not as I do approach. Right? If sin is serious, then its consequences need to be, to be leveled. And so, dads, listen, guaranteed you sin against your children. Guaranteed you sin against your children. If your children must repent and come and seek forgiveness and, and make whatever restitution is, is necessary with regard to their sin, then you do need to do the same thing. I think I had too many do's in that. Well, you need to do the same thing. The standard has to be the same for you. You must recognize when you have sinned. You must repent of your sin against your children. You must go to your children. You must seek their forgiveness. Not command it. Seek it. And if there's restitution appropriate, you need to make restitution. Secondly, you can provoke your children or exasperate your children by exercising a critical spirit so that whatever your children do, it's not good enough. Good job, son. But as soon as you insert the conjunction but after saying good job, son, you have completely invalidated all the good job part. Because now what they will hear is it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. Now, there's a time and there's a place, for sure, to come back around. But listen, if the, in the middle of, of telling your children, your son or your daughter or whatever, they've done a good job, if, if you can't let that sit without feeling the need to, to, you know, pluck the little sliver out of their eye, then I would say take the log out of your own eye first. Okay? If it's a good job, it's a good job. Say it, period, the end. All right, so don't have a critical spirit to your children beyond that. Third, I think. Give, or you exasperate your children when you give them no freedom to fail. You give them no freedom to fail. Or you are constantly rescuing them from their failures. We learn by failure. We learn by failure. Listen, their character, their holiness is more important than their grades in school. Kids, did you hear me say that? Yeah, I bet you did. I bet your ears perked right up on that one. Okay, but if you're going to negotiate grades, make sure you're negotiating it with character. They don't do their assignment? F! F! We homeschooled our children. We had one who had trouble getting their assignments done. And we had a big discussion about this. And my answer was simple. The assignment is due at 5 o'clock on this day. If it's not in at 5 o'clock, I don't mean 501. I mean 5 o'clock. If it's not in, F, zero. Well, they'll get crummy grades. They won't, maybe they won't be able to go to college. Hey, you know what? Character is more important. More important. It was a rough semester. It was a rough semester until they figured out I was serious. Deadly serious. Give them freedom to fail. Let them feel the consequences of their own failures. That's how you learn. That's how you learned. That's how they'll learn. 
You exasperate your children by mocking their shortcomings or their failures. Let them fail, but don't mock them in their failure. Encourage them. Do not mock them. You exasperate your children by inappropriately teasing them. Children are sensitive, particularly when they're in the adolescent years and there's a lot of stuff going on and they're sensitive about that sort of thing. So if if you tease them about these things, you will exasperate them. You will provoke them. There's a place for teasing, to be sure. We need to all be able to laugh at ourselves. But it can be inappropriate. It can go too far. I don't know what number I'm at. Here's another. Exasperate your children. I should have numbered these. Yeah, exasperate your children by unreasonable demands upon them in terms of their behavior or their performance. What do I mean by that? I mean there's, there's age appropriateness. There, there are certain physical skills that, that, that come only as a person matures mentally and physically and so forth. And so if you make unreasonable demands upon your children for, for how they're supposed to behave or how they're supposed to perform or whatever, you can exasperate them. You can provoke them. It's kind of part of the, it's never good enough for you, is it? No matter what I do, it's never good enough. You can provoke your children by making comparisons to other siblings or friends. Why can't you be like, right, fill in the blank. Because I'm not them. I always wanted to say that, but I never had courage. Don't do it. Don't do it. I, you know, I get it. As a parent, it's easy to get, to get pulled into this, but don't do it. Refrain from doing this, Okay. Don't make comparisons. You provoke your children or exasperate your children when you tie the closeness of your relationship to their level of performance. The closeness of the relationship is tied to the level of performance. In other words, a conditional approval. You do well, we're doing great together in this relationship. You're not doing well, this relationship's in trouble. Listen, if God treated us that way, we would all fall into despair. Okay? God does not treat us on the basis of a conditional approval or performance. Listen, he does treat us on the basis of one person's performance, right? Christ. Christ. So don't tie your relationship to your children's performance. Uh, Beyond that, you, you provoke your children when you make them afraid to come to you. And admit their failures or their sins or their spiritual doubts. There's no place for them to come and and to say they're struggling. So they have to stuff it. Because good Christian kids don't struggle. It's a disaster if you find yourself in that position. And that relates, I think, to the last one here. And that is you provoke or exasperate your children when you tie your pride and ego to their external performance as good Christian children. You are a good Christian child, right, if you don't give me any trouble. You'll exasperate them something fierce, all right? So don't provoke, don't exasperate. Instead, Paul says, right, notice the the adversative here, but bring them up in in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In other words, nourish them in the gospel, So don't provoke them to anger, but instead, as a Christian father, we're to to nourish them. Ektrefo, it's it's the same word used over there in chapter 5, verse 29. The husband's approach to his wife, he's to nourish her. So we are to nurture or nourish our children in the the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I think think the idea here is the, the sphere and influence of the Lord. In other words, the gospel. We're to nourish and, and nurture our children in the, in the things of the gospel. And Paul describes that process here with two words, right? Verse 4. The word discipline and the word instruction. The word discipline and instruction. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, these, these words are, are not the same word, but they are closely related to each other. Closely related. 
And I think if we were to try to talk about what, what differentiates them from each other, I think it would be this. That discipline speaks about instructional activity. So, so bring them up with, with, with educational, instructional activity. And, and you, uh, when it says you instruct them in the Lord, it has the idea of the verbal aspect. So you encourage them, you reprove them. So in other words, we, we train our children in the things of the Lord that includes both an educational component, which would be Bible teaching, as well as an encouragement to believe and an admonishment when they don't. Okay, so we teach them the Bible, Dad, and then you, you encourage them to believe the Bible, and when they don't believe the Bible in a particular circumstance, you, you admonish them for that. Now, one way to, to go about admonishing, and, and just file this away somewhere, Ac or questions prick the conscience, accusations harden the hearts. So in your admonishment, adopt a questioning approach. And so ask your children, when, when they have been caught in sin, when they, have, when they have expressed disbelief, ask them this question. What was your sin telling you when you acted in such and such a way? Right? What lie was your sin telling you? What lie was your sin telling you when you acted out, son? Because what this does is it, is it brings the discussion now off of the behavior and to the deceitfulness of sin and, and, the, and the way that sin appeals to the flesh. And it, and it causes the conversation to, to go down to the heart level, to, to deal with the issues of belief and unbelief. Rather than, you know, you did this or you didn't do that. And then you can follow that up in the, in the discussion with a, with a dialogue, something like this. You know, well, what would have been the believing response in such and such a situation? So what lie was your sin telling you? And, and what would have been the believing response in, this, in these circumstances? Now you're getting down to the real issues of what moves and motivates all of us. Now, this kind of stuff takes time. This is, this is time-consuming work. This is soul work, Dad. And it takes a lot of time. And time is probably your most precious commodity, right? But this takes time. It's far easier to focus on external behaviors when it comes to parenting. It is difficult work to do soul work. And when we're honest with one another, in the heat of the moment, what we really want is our children to just stop the sinful whatever it is. Isn't that true? I mean, when we're really honest about it, all we want is to just stop acting like that. Right? Stop inconveniencing me. Stop embarrassing me in front of people. Stop making my life difficult. Do I have to get up off this couch You don't stop. I'm, I'm going to get up off this couch. When I get to three, I'm going to get up and off this couch. It's terrible. It's terrible. Kids are natural gamblers, by the way. Natural gamblers. So if that's the approach, it's crazy. Dad, we need to get behind the behaviors to the motives of the heart and make them the ultimate focus of our parenting, of our child training, to, to raise them, right, to bring them up in the discipline, that is the, the educational instruction, the Bible teaching, and the, in, the instruction of the Lord, that is the, the encouragement and the admonishment to hear and believe. When does this process end? When they're outside the home, sort of, <laughs> sort of. I mean, when they come back and they say, hey, mom, dad, whatever, I was thinking about, you know, whatever, well, you know, you still got to, you got to get down deep. This is disciple making. This is vine work. This is, this is soul work. And we're all called to it. 
but specifically fathers. Dad, you are the doctor of the soul. Get used to it. Wear it big and proud. Become proficient at it. Do your own soul work and the new soul work with your children. One really helpful book that Carol and I found years ago in trying to do soul work with our own children was by uh, Ted Tripp called Shepherding a Child's Heart. Shepherding a Child's Heart. Maybe you know that book. Maybe you've already used it with profit. Maybe it's new to you. But I commend it to you. Okay? Shepherding a Child's Heart. Beloved, as our children grow, it should be our desire that they, that they move, they transition from mere obedience to a spirit-led life in which they honor their mother and father. And, and the spirit empowers them to do that and, and, and motivates them to do that. And when they, when they do that, when they honor you, because the Spirit is, is working in them and, and moving them in that direction, then you know what? In honoring you, they are honoring Christ. They are honoring Christ. And the smile of God rests on them. The smile of God rests on them. And their life will be a good life. They will do right. Right. 